For Money FM 89.3, I'm Manisha Tank, and I'm so pleased to be able to bring a great story to you today. The Singapore-based venture philanthropy organization, and we will find out what that actually means, Leap201 has established a new fund, and it will support migrant workers right here in Singapore, and perhaps in other places, we'll find out more, uh, for during and beyond this COVID-19 pandemic. So this fund, it aims to provide assistance beyond the initial months of the outbreak, and we could even talk about years into the future in terms of helping migrant workers. So let's delve into it. You don't want to listen to me speak and find out what has inspired this initiative as well as what it aims to achieve. I have two highly esteemed gentlemen to speak to me about it. We have Speaker of Parliament, Mr. Tan Chuan Jin, and also Mr. Michael Yen, who is the founder of Leap 201. Guys, hello. Well, hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, hi. Speaker. Excellent. Hi, so Mr. Speaker, first of all, let's talk about how passionate you are about this subject. I have seen it on your social media feeds. I know that you have been speaking to a lot of migrant workers. You've been really passionate about this. Tell us what you've seen and experienced over the last couple of months. Well, as an area of work that I've been involved in for some time, uh, previously in my previous capacity in the Ministry of Manpower. So I've been very much involved, I think not just at the policy level, but on the ground as well. I think to look out for the well-being. Uh, working conditions, living conditions, etc. So I'm quite familiar with the space. A lot of the NGOs that uh, are very active now, uh, folks that I've worked with over the years. Um, firstly, I think it's a really massive outbreak. I think uh, it, it's happening the world over. I think many countries with migrant worker populations are very challenged. I think that in Singapore, we're probably doing more than possibly anywhere else uh, in the world in terms of looking out for them. Um, but there are challenges. Now, obviously, there's an outbreak on a healthcare perspective, so that's important. And we are doing our best to uh, test, to isolate, to trace, and to treat. The positive story so far is that while the numbers can look worrying, um, but because of the profile of a lot of the workers, they're generally younger, healthier, fitter. Um, so far, they've been quite all right. Um, but we do not want to take that for granted. So I think we continue to look out for them and pick up any other symptoms that we need to treat. We'll make sure that they get the full works that's available, that's there. And of course, their well-being, uh, because obviously they're confined to the dormitories, uh, it is quite challenging. So you need to very rapidly mobilize to be able to feed so many thousands of people. Normally, they'll be out there working and suddenly that whole change is uh, quite unprecedented. And the scale is immense. I think sometimes we don't realize it. You know, we, we do see of some individuals complaining about food and so on. But even for ourselves, right, when we have a mass event, many of us might be happy with the food, but there will always be some people that may not find it palatable, genuinely. And when you play it up, it can seem as if that represents the whole picture, but it doesn't. So a lot of NGOs are working hard uh, in, in this space, uh, contributing whatever they can. I've always put up a message that if you are in doubt, you want to help, donate money because that's the most flexible when managing a crisis. Uh, we all mean well, you can be donating materials, but the NGOs can be quite stretched with manpower, logistics, and so on. So contribution in money makes a lot of difference. But where Michael is coming from, I think looking slightly forward, I think that's an interesting space because this crisis is not going to go over. We, we hope they will disappear like SARS. I, I don't think so, but you never know, right? Uh, yeah. And similarly... Uh, I think on the economic front, it's, it's going to have huge ramifications. Companies will close. No matter what we try to do, there will be, that will happen. And there will be workers that will be out of jobs. And you can imagine the anxiety that they will be faced with. So we wish for the best now. We, we, there's a lot of work we need, that needs to be done. But if we project ourselves two, three, four months later, what are some of the newer challenges that might be in place? So this is where I think it behooves us uh, in the community space, NGO space, and also government to discuss and look at what might be some of these concerns and what could we do to address it when the time comes. Well, that's interesting you should raise that because, of course, Michael, you haven't waited for government. Tell us about LEAP201 and tell us about this new initiative. LEAP201 is setting up a new fund that is dedicated to Singapore migrants, both during and beyond the COVID period. So we're looking to support migrants in the areas where they're most vulnerable in terms of low economic security and low health security from living in workers' dorms. Uh, we plan to, we have committed $1 million and we will work closely with migrant worker organizations 
which has been rallying in the last few weeks to support migrants. Um, to give you an example, there are 43 uh, purpose-built dorms in Singapore, and there are 12,000 factory converted dorms in Singapore. The work is immense. Um, we have the government, we have uh, community workers, we have volunteers, and you know, just good old Singaporeans who want to help. They're all rallying together for the migrant workers, and we're very proud to play our part in this effort. Yeah, I want to get into some of the details and the kind of donations that you're expecting to come in in just a moment, but you've just talked about Singaporeans and how they have rallied to the cause. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to raise that with you. Have you been, I mean, I certainly have, if someone just watching and reading about this this particular issue in the press and on TV, have you been moved by the outpouring amongst Singaporeans of help? No, it's very encouraging. I think not just with migrant workers, but I think in terms of donations and helping Singaporeans who may be in distress. And we've seen that in the past. We, we saw that during SARS. Uh, I was involved in a tsunami, and although that was a neighboring country, but you could see many Singaporeans mobilizing and pushing all forms of help forward. But as a, as a recipient or someone operating at the front lines during the tsunami, uh, during the crisis, right? Um, sometimes too much help, um, while well-meaning, can get in the way because the logistics becomes a bit of a challenge, which is why I was saying that actually sometimes if we're not sure, donating in funds make a lot of difference. But the NGOs do need volunteers as well. Of course, with the circuit breaker in place, there are a lot more constraints. They need to clear the volunteers. But if you are able to put in time, they can work the process and uh, clear your name so that you can participate. Because we do need warm bodies to help with some of this work. For example, I've been helping some of the NGOs with um, doing some of the needs assessment in the factory converted dorms. Uh, MOM is familiar with them, uh, but we need perhaps a bit more in-depth uh, sort of contact point to touch base with the dorm operators, have a sense from the workers what the issues are. If there are concerns, whether we can nip it in the butt, trigger mom to come in, rectify it, and that's something that you can't replace with technology. You do need to have people to just be there, talk uh, randomly to some of the migrant workers, have a sense of the issues. So that's where I think Singaporeans could also play a part because it will help you have perhaps a slightly nuanced picture of that scene. I know we're sometimes uh, we are seized by some of the narratives that may be out there put forward by others. And well, Western media will have a certain slant that they, they particularly like. Uh, I would say that that grossly do not represent that picture because many of these NGOs I interviewed and certain selected phrases are captured, but not all. But the best way to do it is to be involved, uh, have a look at what the different NGOs are doing and what the picture appears to them. And there's a real, there's, there are real things that we can do to make a difference. And I'm really glad to see Singaporeans uh, stepping forward in big ways and small ways. Well, of course, one of the things that really helps is funding. So, so Michael, uh, as I understand it, you have some very wealthy backers who are getting behind this. How important is it that these are the people who are coming, coming in with substantial amounts of money? What sort of figures are we talking about? We, we've, we've raised $1 million uh, in, a, you know, in a short period of time because we feel that time is of the essence, not for the immediate needs of uh, meals and mass delivery, which seems to be quite well uh, provided for. But we feel that for those of us who are not in the front lines, we can afford to look further ahead and plan for the next stage. As uh, Speaker Chuan Jin mentioned, the next stage might involve a recession-led retrenchments amongst some of the SMEs who hire migrant workers. And we would like to think beyond to that stage, put down a marker and say, count us in when that happens. And we are probably going to pull our heads together and work together with migrant uh, worker organizations and potentially with regulators to see how we can facilitate the process of cushioning the blow of retrenchment for migrant workers. And Michael, on that note, can we just you know, remind our listeners, remind people who are hearing this conversation that when we talk about migrant workers, we're not just talking about construction workers, are we? And I, I know that your relationship with the subject goes, goes way back to after the tsunami. You mentioned this, yes. you've been quite moved by this for some time. Yes. 
Yes, indeed. We, we, our, our first encounter with uh, migrant workers was in 2004 with uh, Home of Migrant Economics. This was after the tsunami. And um, in addition to the construction workers, most of whom live in the purpose-built dormitories, um, there are factory workers who live in the factory converted dormitories. There are service sector workers who might potentially live in HDB areas. So I, I you know, this is leaving aside the domestic, uh, the domestic foreign workers. So when, when we look at the composition of the 1.4 million foreign workers, um, it's a pretty diverse group. But uh, I was discussing with Speaker Chuan Jin yesterday, and um, you know he thinks that five, six, seven hundred thousand of those who are outside of the domestic uh, foreign workers group are probably going to be the focus of uh, the attention of, of everyone who is now trying to help them. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes people lose their connection, don't they, with, with the numbers of people that we're talking about. And um, Mr. Speaker, what I feel about this initiative, and perhaps you can reflect on it as well, it's very Singaporean in the sense that, you know, if you give a man a fish, you know, he can eat for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, he can eat for a lifetime, he can feed his community, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There is such a strong element of that about this. So, like in the case, for example, like Singaporeans, we want to make sure, and the whole approach is this, even for the migrant workers, because when SMEs obviously hire both migrant workers uh, as pass holders, employment pass holders, etc., uh, and the, but Singaporeans as well. So when an SME closes or businesses of whatever nature closes, you are losing jobs of uh, all kinds for Singaporeans and for the foreigners who may be working here. And every company also generates services. Services needs to be provided to them. Other companies are supporting them. So the whole network. And I think the, the ramifications of this whole crisis is, uh, from an economic front is actually quite immense because it's not just domestic in Singapore, but across the board. So I think the priority that the government has is to make sure, can we keep the companies afloat so that companies can continue to keep the workers? And what we have done locally is to make sure can the workers, if they're not meaningfully employed, could we then provide subsidies for training and so on and so forth. So that when the rebound comes, and I hope there will be a rebound of sorts, we are well placed to run. But invariably, there will always be casualties. Uh, we hope to keep that to the minimum. But when that happens, what do you do? How do you help the Singaporean workers who are then laid off? And especially for the foreign workers, because I could imagine you, you wouldn't be just one, a couple of companies. There might be sectorally, uh, maybe those who are impacted in a very big way. Would there be any growth areas where other companies would be keen to hire them so that they don't need to go back? Because um, for, sub, for some of the workers from certain countries, for example, India, Bangladesh, they may have paid a fair sum to come here. Uh, that could cause a lot of distress. But if you can keep them here and then you're able for them to find new jobs with new employers, that would be helpful. But what happens in interim, that's always a big challenge. Absolutely. And I want to pick up on this point about uh, debt amongst migrant workers. Michael, can you just tell us how difficult of a situation is that and how will this initiative help people very specifically on that issue? We, we understand from studies that have been made and from people on the ground that recruitment fees and training fees and agent fees can amount to um, up to $12,000. And when you think of a migrant, uh, you know, a foreign worker's um, non-domestic starting pay at, uh, let's call it $500, there is a substantial uh, amount of time before he can pay back this loan. So what happens in the event of a retrenchment in the middle of a payback period is we need to help them find a different job. So what we're doing, what we want to do is to try to help the retrenched workers find a new employer, but we are also trying to help the SME who is currently employing this retrenched worker to transfer the worker because that's the only way they can recover their bond. So it's it's not a it's 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 not a zero sum game. I, I think you know there are situations where both the SME who is giving up the worker and the new SME who hires the worker, 
it, if we make a match, it's win-win. So the question is, how do we make this process more efficient uh, and how do we facilitate this? Right. And Michael, when does the rollout begin? When can people start finding out uh, how the initiative works? How can they get involved? There are some current schemes um, that are being operated, which allows for a change of employment. Currently, as you all know, a work permit holder, uh, work permit is tied to a specific employer. And, and I think that's usually works, you know, in, in, when the economy is strong, that works pretty well. But I think if you see a potential scenario of a recession, and some of the SMEs may need to retrench um, their workers, um, that we could have substantial numbers who need to transfer. And then the question is, is the infrastructure and the matching sufficient to deal with larger numbers? Uh, and we hope to work constructively for those who are currently already involved in this effort. Uh, and I, I understand that it's, uh, it, it has already started in, uh, in construction, but we believe that it can also be rolled out to other sectors, such as the restaurant sector, which is obviously getting a huge disruption right now and creating a lot of anxiety amongst um, foreign workers in restaurants. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on that note, there is a lot of disruption going on. Uh, a lot of it is, of course, the knee jerk to everything that's happening in the world right now. And obviously, Singapore is being affected as, as much as many other countries out there. But for the longer term, the medium to longer term, do you see a shift change in attitudes? Do you see a shift change in the narrative? Well, I think uh, one of the things that we've always tried to do uh, is to make sure that in terms of productivity, to encourage companies to be more productive so that you can be less dependent on, for example, migrant workers. Um, construction industry, for example, we've been trying to incentivize to shape the industry so that they can adopt more productive ways of operating. Um, I haven't been tracking the latest figures, but I know that there were some improvements because we see in other countries where perhaps where they have access to less migrant workers, they operate quite differently. Now, how do you then incentivize these companies to move that way? So this whole event might force a lot of industries to begin to relook to see whether they, are, they should be a lot more aggressive. So that is not a bad thing because I think it's always good to move up the productivity chain so that I think migrant workers will still play a part, but perhaps the need and the demand might be different. Uh, that's one. I think the other one which some people say that, you know, because of this uh, acute awareness, because of, of the, the spread of the disease and, and so on, and, and people are affected by it. Um, and whether Singaporeans can become more conscious and accepting. But I think to be fair, when you talk to many of the migrant workers, and many of them are here for a long time, 10 years, 15, 20 years, and just randomly, not, not by staging it or anything. Yeah. And even if you go on the street, if we consciously spend time to talk to them, many of them have very positive experiences with Singaporeans. You know? So it's not as if we're saying that, oh, Singaporeans treat them very badly. And there will be those, there'll be a bit of that Nimbe syndrome from time to time. But actually, by and large, I would say that from my own sense, uh, is that actually a fair number of them do have positive experience. But be that as it may, it's always good to be able to deepen that sense of not just tolerance, but acceptance and integration of some sort. But I think the sea change, uh, hopefully, would be to embark on a more aggressive front in terms of to be a lot more productive and perhaps a bit less labor intensive in some of these areas which we traditionally have depended on uh, migrant labor. Well, I have to say, even in the course of my journalistic work, I've heard firsthand from some migrant workers who have been very appreciative of the effort that has been made to provide them with food, to take care of them, and the sort of medical care that they're getting right now. And again, that's a huge uh, shout out, really, to all of the healthcare workers on the front line who are doing all of that testing. Michael uh, and Mr. Speaker, we are going to wrap it up very soon. But before we do, Michael, I wanted to talk to you about a poll that has recently come out. And that poll, uh, which has come out, it was done by Global Citizen and Glocalities, which is a, an agency of some sorts. And it came out saying that 82% of people, those that they polled, believe that billionaires should step in to solve our problems of poverty. But it's not all about aid, right? How can people do this in a constructive and empowering way? I haven't read this study, but um, my, 
my cousin has spoken, uh, Lawrence has spoken about this uh, on behalf of our Lian Foundation. Um, the LEAP initiative is very much ground up. And the people who are involved, the donors, uh, NG Chan Rai, he, he founded Olam and he's worked in all of Africa and Asia, starting up new businesses uh, and United Overseas Bank, uh, Wee Chong. They, their heart is in helping people. Uh, they have no interest in responding to, uh, you know, you know, sort of public uh, commentary. So they are very interested in what is our first, what is going to be our first project. And the first thing I did, you know, once I got them on board, was to speak to Speaker Chuan Jin, who has been very deeply involved in this space. And we have ongoing dialogues, which is and the, one of the first things we decided that is worth looking into is how to facilitate change of employer and get a better hit rate. Whether it stays within an industry sector or whether it crosses from one industry to another, um, I, 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 I think this is a structural uh, improvement which may also be relevant post-COVID. And I fully agree with what the speaker says in terms of um, increasing productivity going forward. So I, I think let's not let a crisis go to waste. Let's emerge from this crisis having a better buffer for the migrant workers and the SMEs uh, into the recession. But most importantly, it is a win-win if the economy in the Singapore economy can restart without huge friction, shipping back large numbers of migrant workers and then shipping new migrant workers back 18 months from now, that is hugely inefficient. So, so I think, you know, whether we look at this from a humanitarian angle uh, or from a practical angle of, okay, everyone wins if we do this right. Uh, I, I like to say the people we are talking to, the speaker, uh, NG Chan Rai, we, Chung, we, we are looking at solutions that will be relevant through COVID and beyond COVID. I mean, that sounds wonderful. And it's uh, definitely another real call to action for many Singaporeans who, who can help, who are in a position to help. Um, I think I have to wrap it up with you, Mr. Speaker, because you've been very much behind this whole cause. If you had to share some words of encouragement right now as we look out beyond the horizon, what would they be? Well, I think firstly to respond to the study that you quoted, that whether the billionaires should contribute. Uh, I think they should. everyone should contribute whatever they can. But I think I believe very strongly it's not just about money. Money makes a lot of difference. Um, but when you really need to deal with whether on the migrant worker uh, issues or with inequality, actually it's about time, people's time. I think when you have that human contact, it brings something that's very different. Money, you know, you think that, oh, then you hire more social workers, hire more health officers. But the fact of the matter is that that will never be enough. I think there is a role for all of us to play, to give of our time and a part of our lives and the lives of others. Because that human contact, I think, makes a lot of difference on many fronts. And I, it doesn't just, and we can begin to talk about preemptive work, because when you do preventive work, you go upstream, the numbers become a lot. And that's something the that money cannot solve either. You need warm bodies to be on the ground, uh, reading to the kids so that they have exposure, so that you help them bridge the gap. Um, and I think the wonderful thing is that we change in the process. Because when we give of ourselves to others, I think what we gain isn't just about dealing with the people who need help. We ourselves begin to change. And when we change, cumulatively, I think society changes. So it's a, actually an opportunity for us to build a very different society. Right? So I think while on the one hand, we encourage people to give their money, but I think time is something all of us can do. And I think for the immediate term is that I think this... COVID-19 situation, I mean, like I said, we hope it all fades away, but I think it's going to be the monumental experience of all our lifetimes. I think many of us will not have encountered anything quite like this before, but there's nothing you can do about it, right? It, it is there, it is unfolding, we do what we can, but could we make it possibly the best possible experience that we can be, so that you don't waste a good crisis, you come out of this better in many ways, uh, we could restructure, but more importantly as a spirit, I think could this be in years to come as we look back 
that this was one of our defining moments as a people. And that's something all of us can do uh, in terms of contributing and participating in a constructive way. And I think that's something that we can look forward to. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Certainly a very reflective time. Um, Michael, I saw you leaning forward. Did you have one last, last thought? I, uh, to pick up on the speaker's point uh, about time and emotional connection, I, I think that all Singaporeans, including the migrant workers, will be having significant psychological stress you know, in this period because of isolation, because of uncertainty. And, um, and I do think some of these effects can be dealt preemptively, as the speaker mentioned. Um, in t you know, whether we do it through counseling, telecounseling, uh, or forming mutual aid groups within the migrant communities facilitated by the NGOs, by the church groups. Um, I, I think that's the um, non-tangible but crucial piece which is not about money. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you also so much. Thank I've you. been speaking to Speaker of Parliament, Mr. Tan Chuan Jin, and also Mr. Michael Yen, who is the founder of Leap 201 that has launched this initiative today. Thanks so much to both of you. Money FM 89.3.